What about the people that say, you know, I want to do less. I want to have like less stress, less worry. How can I, how can I create more without the pressure and the stress yes. or anxiety that might seem to come with it? How yes. can I create it and also have inner peace? Is yeah. that possible as someone in your position as a high level CEO well, and executive and running billion dollar companies? Is it possible <laughs> to have inner peace while also creating massive impact? Sure. So like as an example, I, I identified for you, first of all, here's why I think, this is why I think it is possible. You talked about this idea of self-love and acceptance mm -hmm. and understanding like what drives you and who you are and why you're here. Like I may not be peaceful every day, but I am at peace. Yes. Does that make sense? Yeah, like, of course. So I think it's different for different <laughs> people. Like I just want to be clear, like I'm good with being a CEO. I'm good that that's my path of impact. I am good that there is a higher universe that I may or may not achieve everything I want. Like I, I am like totally good with it. So I consider myself at peace because I know that yeah. anything may come my way and it will be okay. Right. Like, like, look, I could fail miserably and I'll be okay because I have a very good sense of like, like my sense in the universe that I am loved by God. Like I, like yeah. literally that I am loved, that I am, a, you know, I'm a full human being that I am. Yeah. Anyway. So, so I think that if you say, how do you find peace? Look, peace means different things for pe different people. For me, peace means that I like, I am in a role and every day waking up and have a way to express my gifts. Mm. That for me is peaceful. You know, That's when cool. I don't feel peaceful, I feel, I, I don't feel at peace when I don't know what it is. So like, <laughs> Does that make sense? So like yeah. my zone may be a zone of anxiety because every day I think I'm pushing myself right. to express my gifts, but I'm at peace with that. So right. I don't know, like, oh, it depends what you mean by peace. There are people for whom fine, being present in the moment, um, expressing who they, full authentic, who they fully authentically are is completely different. Mm. And so I think peace means different things to different people. For me, I'm at peace when I'm like going 100 miles an hour. Right, right, right. <laughs> because well, that to me Chaos is, is ensuing, And yes. not even chaos, but like I'm in pursuit of impact and purpose, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Fully. And, and that I'm can be fully messy. functioning. And that can be messy. And it's messy, but like, like maybe part of my gift is I can deal with mess. If you're a CEO, you right. deal with mess all the time. You deal with grit. You deal with big possibility and small possibility. Yeah. You deal with problems. You deal with people being upset. Like, so maybe that's part of my gift, right? Mm. That I can handle all those things. You can hold the space okay. for I thousands the of space. employees, problems and, and ups and downs yeah. and challenges. Yeah. and That's right. And maybe that's part of what I meant to do, mm. right? In the world to help people. And the, by mm. the way, there are many different ways to express your gifts as right. we come back to. So, so is it possible to be a CEO and be at peace? Yes, it depends on what you're pursuing. Mm. And, and I think to be at peace with yourself, you just need to know not what makes you happy, what makes you fulfilled. Like, like, what gives you fulfillment? And for me, like the pursuit of impact gives me fulfillment. How does someone discover what the unique gift is if they don't know what it is? I would say to people, if you don't know what it is, ask. Ask, ask someone others. else. Ask somebody. Ask the people who know you the best. Ask what? Um, what's uh, my gift? <laughs> you no, know, what's interesting. So I'll give you an example. Like people are like, I, I, so when I give business talks, people, you know, I start any conversation with like, do you know your superpowers? Mm. And you know, like whether it's MBAs or like new grads or CEOs, like a third of the room puts up their hand, which I find annoying. <laughs> not annoying and like no, not annoying in a bad way, but kind of, I'm like annoying, annoying for the older people, not the young people. I'm like, okay, if you're telling me that you've gone this far in your career and you're being false, mod falsely modest, that's not that helpful. Because if you're a leader mm. and you don't know what your gifts are or your areas of vulnerability, you how do you ever, know. you yeah. need to know, right? Yeah. So that's false modesty. And if you're younger, I say, if you don't know, Ask the people around you, like, you know, what do you think I'm uniquely gifted at? And I think sometimes the answers will surprise you, mm. but you'll find the threads of who you are. So I don't think that we're really good at getting, when we're younger, at getting feedback on who we are and what makes us shine. What we get feedback on is, are we good in school or are we smart or what have you? But like what your unique gifts are, I think your friends and family and even your colleagues will use two or three words to describe you. Mm. So you may not say, what's my unique gifts? You're just like, you know, like, what do you think I'm great at? You know, or what do you think, where do you think I shine? And I think you'll hear words that come up again and again and again from all the people in your life mm. that know you professionally and personally. That's interesting. Um, and I just don't think people move through the world with that, you know, with that understanding. Yeah. Um, Do you think we should be pursuing fulfillment then in our gifts and over happiness? I guess I believe that fulfillment, fulfillment can lead to happiness. Like I think, yeah. and, and they think that um, an impact can lead to happiness. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I know there are other people who are like, hey, just be happy in what you're doing every day and the tasks of what you do, and that leads to fulfillment. And I think it's bi-directional. Like if you want to pursue happiness and happiness gives you fulfillment, great. If you want to 
you know, pursue fulfillment. If fulfillment gives you happiness, great. They're two sides of the same coin. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know that. Um, I think that there's something um, ethereal about when you say to people like happiness, like be happy today. I'm like, okay, you can be happy today, but you still need to have bifocals on, right? Like right. happy today. Maybe some people, their best life is they maximize happiness every day. And for mm. other people, their best life is they might minimize happiness on a given day, but maximize happiness over a cycle. Mm. Both are possible. It's yeah. not an either or. But if somebody says to me, pursue happiness every day, I'd be like, well, actually, by, by virtue of being a CEO, like every day is not happy. You deal with a lot of like messy problems that are very stressful, right? <laughs> but over the course of your, you know, of your career, you find fulfillment and you look back and you're like, I wouldn't have it any other way. So is right. that happiness too? Right, right. So, but I, but I see both. Like my, my husband is a very different person for me. We're kind of very complimentary. And I think my husband in a good way, perceive, you know, um, like uh, pursues happiness every day. That's mm -hmm. a great way to be. Yeah. There are days I wake up and I wish I could pursue happiness right. every day, <laughs> yeah. right? Like, so that's what I'm saying. The two sides of the same coin. So is sure, his life sure. better than mine or worse than mine? No, they're just different. Sure, like, sure. He maximizes his happiness, I think, every day or every week, and I maximize mine over maybe two years, I yeah, like yeah. five years, or like you know a month. It doesn't matter, right? We're we're both in pursuit of the same yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, what about you? Do you pursue happiness every day, or do you pursue? Do you have this arc, and you're willing to I, take a lot of unhappiness every day to be? I'm I'm I pursue growth and, and impact every day. Yes, yeah, so you pursue fulfillment yeah, leading I to pers happiness, yeah. not happiness leading to fulfillment. But I'm also I. I pursue delayed gratification as well. Yeah. Like I, I pursue pain yeah. so that I can stay healthy. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's yeah, like I do course. things that are uncomfortable consistently so that I live a happier, healthier life long term. Yes. As opposed yes. to short term like happiness or relief or Oh yes. And by the way, like I would say I mean? my husband is like that. He's yeah. a he's a he's a former athlete. So or professional athlete. So to your point, on the physical front and so on, he will wow. pursue good health every day. And and actually, I make poor choices. Every day. <laughs> <You're> like, <laughs> you know, but but we're probably both trying to optimize yeah, for delayed gratification yeah. in different ways. Yeah, that's great. Okay, I want to shift the conversation. There's a stat that I saw. Around 65% of businesses failed during the first 10 years. Mm -hmm. And you worked with a lot of multi-billion dollar companies, uh, as well as some failed some failed yes, startups. Yes, yes, yeah, both. Why do you think most businesses fail, and what can we do to build stronger businesses? I think a lot of businesses fail for two or three different reasons, but I'm going to outline the couple that are most important. Okay. And it comes back to what I believe about people, too. First and foremost, in anything we execute as entrepreneurs, you know, let's take the example of being an entrepreneur because it's totally related to running a startup. We tend to believe that it's all about us. Remember that worldview I just uh -huh. talked about? We think it's all about us. Right, right, right. But most times, when you look at businesses, there's like macro and micro. Businesses, like I would say, if you like, if you want to understand why you're failing and succeeding, you can say it all comes down to my execution. What could I be doing better, right? And that's true. You should go take the feedback on what you can be doing and optimizing. We're going to talk about it in a moment. But first, I'm like, lift your head up. What's going on around you that's impacting your success or failure? So. When you look at businesses that thrive, I'm always like, okay, look at the tailwinds that they're riding, you know, or the look tailwinds. at the, the, the tailwinds that they might be riding or the headwinds they're facing. So I'm like, so I think the first reason that mm -hmm. businesses might succeed or fail is they are overly attuned to their execution and maybe not as attuned to the macro tailwinds and headwinds. Um, in the book, I give a story of my, the story of my sister who ran an optometry practice. And for many years, it was going really well. Yes. By the way, much more than 10. Like probably probably ran that practice for 12, 15 years, always growing, right? Growing, uh, and she had employees, had thoughtful fulfilled at work, all of those things, uh -huh. her own boss, all those things. And then it started to go into decline. Why? So, uh, and it started in steady decline, and every year she was eating into more of her savings. And mm. I said, well, Nikki, I was like, okay, so let's step back. So let's step back and understand why your business is in decline. By the way, she, she knows, she's very smart. She's like, well, I'm in a mall. This mall has less foot power traffic. There are now three optometrists in this mall, um, so more competition. The mall itself is less foot traffic because traffic more people are shopping online. Oh, and wait, there's also a lot of companies that are starting to sell you glasses online. So an optometrist makes their money, not just by doing eye exams, but the most lucrative part of the practice is, guess selling what? Selling product. Selling products. Yeah. Okay, so now you look at those macro trends. 
So Nikki's business is starting to decline. And I'm like, Nikki, like, let's look at your choices. She's like, well, this is all I know. This is what I know. Like, I am. I've been doing this for 20 years. I've and been it's training mine. Yeah, and, you know, I know baby, it. It's, yeah, it's, right. Yeah. So let's look at this. Right. So a business that's doing well then turns into decline. So you could say, Nikki, run faster. Keep keep your, you know, hours up later. Marketing like, spend. You know, this, spend yeah. more. Right. Get better inventory. Okay. Let's stop a moment. Mm. Your location is in decline. You have more competition. Like, this trend is not going anywhere, right. right? Like, and by the way, the mall charges you fixed rent and wants to increase the rent here. Right, right. Okay, so like at the macro level, is this scenario going to work? You can try and out execute your way out of this mousetrap. Is it going to work? Before the interview continues, if you feel like you're not living your most authentic life, not leaning into your purpose, and not living the life that your future self would be extremely proud of, I've written a new book called The Greatness Mindset. And I think you're going to love this. Through powerful stories, science backed strategies, and step by step guidance, The Greatness Mindset will help you overcome all the different challenges in your life to design the life of your dreams and then turn it into your reality. Make sure to click the link below in the description to get your copy today. Okay, let's get back to this video. And so then we charted a course and she, you know, we laid out five new options and ultimately my sister ended up taking one after five or six years and sold her practice and moved to a new location and worked for a growing franchise of optometry practices that bought her practice and that's closer to her home wow. and, you know, are able to compete because they have the dollars and capital to go figure out how they're going to drive people to their own location. It's not okay. all on her making it's all the It's not on her, yeah, right? Yeah. And so that's a perfect example of when I say macro versus micro, you have to lift your head up and assess yes. the tailwinds and headwinds of your macro situation. Yes. So the first flaw is many people think it's all about them. It's not all about them. Okay, that's piece one. Now let's come to the part that is all about you, which is we sort of want to make one decision and stick with it. And I think this is sort of a big part of the thesis for why I wrote the book. We think it's one decision to success. We think it's one choice to success. And I'm like, okay, well, whether you want to or not, the conditions around you keep changing. Mm -hmm. uh, you may want them to stay static, but they're not. Um, and so... What if I told you that for you to keep succeeding, you need to keep choosing? It's like actively keep choosing. You have choosing to keep choosing. Choosing new decisions. Choosing new decisions, taking new risks. Yes. Getting in tighter feedback loops, adjusting, 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 right? Always. So, always. So obviously tech is very good at this, right? But we're yes. not this good at this in small businesses or in our own careers. You say, you know how like you like you wanna you wanna just do something and set it, right? <laughs> Life doesn't set work that way. Set it and forget it. Exactly. Life doesn't work that way. Right? So like businesses don't work that way. So like you want to set it and forget it. But as my old CTO at StubHub would say, like, like product market fit is elusive. You think that you do something and then you have it. You but don't. then something adjusts and then you need to adjust and then you need to keep adjusting. So like this is the way our lives unfold. This is the way businesses unfold. So if you said to me like, you know, why do you, and, and I think Paul Graham at YC talks about this, like sometimes to make it, you have to survive. And surviving is about pivoting, 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 mm, pivoting, pivoting. Constantly. Right? Constantly. And so I think if you want to set it and forget it, I don't know if many businesses now that work that way because every single business is being disrupted. And by the way, if they're not being disrupted by technology, even being, small businesses. Being disrupted by the pandemic or you're politics just, right, or you this got it. or whatever. Local politics. Everything. A competitor down the street, right? So you have to keep adjusting. Some new innovation that comes out or some new you technology. Got it. So whether yeah. it's micro or macro, remember we said life lives in possibility. So you have to keep pursuing the next possibility because at the minute you're like at stasis, whether mm. you're a small business or whether you're a gigantic startup, you know, with plenty of money, you have to keep adjusting. So first of all, I think people are not nearly heads down enough when it comes to adjustments, adjusting. They're, but not, that willing in turn, to, they're not willing to adjust? Yeah, enough? not willing to adjust. Like, and like, you know, it's like, as I said, they want to set it and forget it. And I think number two, so you have to keep pivoting to keep product market fit. And then number two, so I'm like, you have to be heads down, but heads down to pivoting. <laughs> right. And then you have to be heads up to like the environment around you and the stuff that's not all about you and then find mm. your responses. So Gosh. I know that sounds like a very simplistic thing for like, why do some businesses, you know, take 10 years to, uh, you know, just like, Look, the board list is five years old. It's my own startup, right? It just raised season funding. The board list is always adjusting. Like, mm -hmm. I can't tell you what it'll be in five years. It's not the same thing now as it was when it started. It wasn't. And by the way, if we want to be there in five years, like, we're going to have to keep adjusting as we go. And, like, there's going to be new entrants and new competition and new legislation. And, like, and so sometimes I understand that that's, like, tiring. But that's the way the world that's works, That's the way right? business will thrive. It, the only way it'll thrive. The only way it'll thrive is if you're willing to keep adjusting. Now, the good news is, like... If it's a small business, that doesn't mean you have to go, you know, uh, it like your adjustments might be micro adjustments, right. right? 
but it's like this. You have to it's change like, your whole product line and everything. Yeah, the, exactly. Yeah. Right. And maybe you're going to make a thousand adjustments and one day you'll end up in an entirely new business. Or maybe you'll make a thousand adjustments and your business will be just a better, better version of what it is today. Uh-huh. I don't know the answer. But if you say to me, like, why do startups fail? And I know that's a lar- like a long question, a long answer to your question. I'm sort of like, first of all, it's not all about you. Heads up. And then mm-hmm. the part that is about you is about adjusting and pivoting. So like heads down, keep pivoting. <laughs> keep it, yeah, right. You how, do you, how do you learn to keep pivoting when, you know, part of business success and growth and scale is like automating systems, having mm-hmm. processes in place, having, you know, procedures that are constantly then, okay, we've got to constantly shift these processes and shift the, well, you know, actually, the, I think the software and change these things. Yeah, I should have used a better word than pivoting. Let's call it iterating. Yeah. So, you know, businesses are iterative cycles of yes. focus. So that's sort of my point. So, like, let's say you're in your company and uh, competition is, like, you know, is is increasing. You know, as I said, there's, like, 10 painting companies down the road that have just emerged. Yeah. And you run a, a exterior paint company. I'm like, okay. This is when I, when I, I shouldn't say pivoting. What I mean is, like, constantly iterating on the part that needs it, right? Mm. So you have to sequentially say, like, okay. Hold the rest of this part. I need now need to go figure out like what my marketing strategy is. Okay, when that's done, like you know, there will be yet another thing to iterate on. So I think it's pivoting is probably uh, has a higher connotation, like uh, like as if you're not focused. What I'm suggesting is like you have to serially iterate and focus on different. Like, right? And it's like it's going like full way around a circle and then maybe coming all the way back. Like um, so that's what I mean more. Than, yeah, like, it's like iterating. <sighs> This is good stuff. I mean, I feel like a lot of people had to learn that lesson the hard way during the pandemic. Right. Because if you didn't pivot or iterate, then you're failing. Yeah, yeah. The like pandemic it forced was you like, to yes. fail yes. if yes. you weren't willing to evolve. Right. Well, don't you think so? Uh, again, just sort of like this is this is the whole reason this is a good time to have a conversation about risk taking and how to evolve and grow yourself, right? Because I feel like in the pandemic, people really learned a lot more about their risk taking ability. When times were tough. They either like held back or they went all in on something, right? You got it, right. But either way, don't you believe in the pandemic, people learned a lot more about their agility and resilience and ability to pivot fast than they learned when times were good. Absolutely. Right? So when we're trying to avoid harm, active harm, we often are actually more risk-taking than we are like in our daily safe lives. And you're like, what's that all about? This is a good time to ask that question. Yeah. Which is why I think that... um, the pandemic should have given us all confidence that we're much more capable of response than we think you're agile response, right? And so your opportunity is, okay, if you know that about yourself, what holds you back when times are good? And it's often things like ego, right? Yeah. Like personal fear of personal failure, right? And that's why I'm like, okay, believe in like what's possible today and try it. And if it's not, you iterate your way out of it. Yes. Like I sort of am a believer that you can, if this book's bad, I'm going to iterate my way out of it. Yeah. If this podcast, you know, if like people are like, oh my God, she's a crier. Like this podcast gets a two rating. I'm going to iterate my way yeah, out of it, yeah, right? Yeah. So um, I just believe that people learned a lot more about their capacity to respond. And so it gives us all a lot more choice than we think we have. Do you feel like you took bigger risks during the pandemic or did you? Oh, for sure. Yeah. I mean, look, I took I took big risks and small risks. At work, as you know, I was running StubHub, and we had just sold the company yeah. at the time. A month the before you sold happened. it, right? Yeah, we sold it on the uh, we sold it on February thirteenth, and on March thirteenth, our business crazy. You know, our business collapsed, That's like sick. everybody in live right. in live events, and so um, and it's really interesting because I was running StubHub. I'd been bought in to run StubHub by eBay, which was the parent parent company of StubHub, and I would say eBay was attracted to me as StubHub CEO because I had just come from being an entrepreneur. I'd been at Google early in my career and scaled, and then I'd been an entrepreneur for seven years. And so I think eBay wanted that entrepreneurial energy back at StubHub because uh-huh. StubHub had been, was, at that point, was Stagnated. owned by almost 10 years by eBay. Right. And its growth was slowing, and costs were you know maybe higher than they should be. Margin was declining. And so I think I was bought in to bring that entrepreneurial energy right and to help StubHub pivot. So and, and find new services and all sorts of things. So I felt like I spent, and we had a, I love the team we had at StubHub. They're just a great group of humans. But I still felt like we spent, I spent one and a half, 
months out of my two years of tenure trying to train people to be more agile. I'm like, really? okay, guys, you have to make multiple moves and we can come there next if you want. I, I have a thesis on what it takes for businesses to really succeed. And the research would say it doesn't take one move, it takes multiple moves for you to be an outperformer. So we'll talk about that. Mm. So I'm trying to train them to be agile. It's like, look, over here we need to cut costs. Over here we need to get international going. Over here we need to try new services. Over here we need to reinvest in the core. Right? You're trying to create a portfolio strategy, but teaching people to be more agile, right? And so here we are and for nine months working at changing the culture and you know getting people to take more risks at right, work right. and all those things. And people, we're making progress. Leadership development. And all all yeah, those yeah, things, yeah. right? And then what happens? The pandemic happens and the entire company goes into crisis mode. Really? And, and oh. within a month, we restructured the business. We changed policies overnight. We took risks to make sure we survived. Right. And we took them rapidly in 100% of our employee base was on board, hands like, hands on deck just figuring it out in real time. And it was like one of my proudest moments, wow. those most stressful moments as a CEO, because people all learned about their agility. So like we made more decisions, right, and pivoted. Like think about it, running a company for EBITDA and gross part, more margin points of growth and revenue growth for like 99% of your tenure. And then all of a sudden you move to a cash flow business, literally, do we have enough cash? To pay this month's yeah, <laughs> yeah, pay, salaries, like, Yeah, yeah, expenses. like literally. And by the way, we're no longer owned by eBay. We're owned by another private startup whose cash constrained themselves. Like, do we have enough money? Oh my God, customers are asking for hundreds of millions of dollars in refunds. Like, mm. where is the money? I mean, <laughs> like literally you go to managing on cash, like you go to manage daily, weekly, wow. monthly cash for a company that hasn't been used to that for like the entirety of its last 10 to 15 years, right? So. 10 years at least with uh, under eBay. So anyway, long-winded way of saying, I think that uh, we learn more in crisis. I learned more, certainly as a CEO, was the most intense period I've ever been through. You're here to give purpose and service to other mm -hmm. people, right? So uh, it's his way yeah. of being. It's his way of being. Like when somebody he didn't say it, he just wasn't. Yeah, he just wasn't. Yeah. Like, you know, there's like conversations about these yeah. things, right? It's just like you see this living embodiment of it. So I'd say that his second lesson was probably about just like, you're here to be of service and to have impact, right? So. Um, I think that's probably 